factors to detect covert lymphedema in adolescents and young adults infected with lymphatic psoriasis. And this paper will be presented by Janet Douglas from James Cook University in Australia. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you to AST and H and all the sponsors for making this um, meeting possible. I'm not getting any advancing of the slides here. Okay. Okay. Um, lymphedema after treatment for breast cancer is one of the most feared consequences for women who undergo that procedure. And the long-term consequences are uh, fibrous and fat induration in the tissues, hyperkeratosis of the skin, and it's incurable lifelong condition requiring a lot of intensive treatment. Over the years we have really brought that <coughs> treatment back to the point where we are now looking at preventative treatment. So we've developed a whole lot of devices that can pick up very early changes in the um, lymphatic dysfunction and we measure women preoperatively, we monitor them closely, we apply preventative interventions. It's looking like there's some hope now that we will see no breast cancer related lymphedema somewhere in the future. This has required the establishment of a stage zero lymphedema. Uh, lymphedema after lymphatic filariasis is essentially the same chronic condition with the same changes in the tissues. If uh, it's left untreated it will naturally progress with all those same changes in the skin and the tissue. The WHO recommends um, community-based home care for treatment of filarial related lymphedema but what's obvious to me when I look at this um, these recommendations is there's really very minimal interventions recommended for early lymphedema. We're not really doing anything at that early stage so by the time we get to these later stages they become really resource intensive treatments and conspicuously for me no stage zero in this, um, in this program at all. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr Sue Gordon, took some of those devices that we're now using for our breast cancer patients to um, Papua New Guinea and she measured young people living in an LF endemic area and she found statistically significant differences in the legs of the infected kids compared to the uninfected kids. So my study is a larger study in an endemic region in Myanmar Two aims to see if we can pick up latent lymphedema in this uh, population and then identify what would be the optimal point and form of intervention if we can um, detect uh, the latent lymphedema. So uh, the study has uh, got a couple of other parts to it. You'll hear tomorrow from uh, Ben Dixon who did the morbidity survey. Myanmar has basically no data on its, on its uh, morbidity. Uh, we've got a cross-sectional study and a longitudinal study. I started in uh, September 2013 travelling with the World Health Organisation team to observe the NDA in, in that area in Myanmar and identified five townships that were highly endemic for LF and uh, saw lymphedema in every township um, that we were there but there was no, at that point, no, nobody was offering them any kind of treatment. Uh, so, as I said, Ben will be telling you tomorrow afternoon about the uh, morbidity survey that he conducted in, in the same area. The cross-sectional survey, we uh, screened for LF using ICT. We, took, we uh, age and gender matched 50 negative uh, young people with 50, uh, sorry, 50 positive young people with 50 negative uh, controls, age and gender matched. And then we took physical measures of their legs. We also took um, blood samples which were used on uh, dried filter paper and also we've got the uh, plasma for biochemical analysis. And we uh, measured again after they had taken the MDA in 2014 and then we measured them again after the positive cases had been treated with deworming medication, medication in March 2015. We've started some of the analysis. We've done serology with OG4C3 and BM14 ELISA, which will confirm our positive and negative cases. That was done by the Department of Medical Research in Yangon. 
Uh, we've got three devices that we use to measure tissue compressibility and uh, bioimpedance spectroscopy, which can measure extracellular fluid loads in the tissues. Um, another study, another uh, JCU student, Jesse Mason, is doing a comparison of the filter papers and the plasma um, for BM14 and OG4C3 ELISA. And then we've got uh, analysis of the plasma. We want to use that for um, pro-inflammatory cytokines and vascular endothelial growth factors, which we know are um, involved in early changes in lymphedema. I'm giving you the results today of the three devices that we use to measure tissue compressibility. So the mechanical tonometer, this is the one that Sue took to Papua New Guinea. It's a fairly simple device. It has a 200 gram weight sitting on the top of the device. There's a plunger that extends from the foot plate. It simply measures the resistance to that 200 grams of pressure into the tissue. It's got some problems because it's gravity. Um, as soon as your limb is not quite, you know, exactly level, you've got some changes in your readings. So Flinders Biomedical Engineering developed a digital version. So now we've got a little electric motor that, that um, drives the, the plunger through the foot plate into the tissue. And just more recently, uh, Delphin Technologies in Finland have developed a skin fibre meter, and this is only delivering 50 grams of of pressure. So you can see where the research in the cancer related lymphedemas are going. We're looking for more and more and more subtle changes so that we can pick things up as early as possible. Uh, my 317 people that we screened at baseline, most of them were young adolescent women. I'm still not getting an advance. Oh, here we go. Most of them were young adolescent uh, girls. Um, most of them came from a village called Sachinwa. We had an overall rate of close to 20% infection, which didn't differ very much between the genders. Slightly more of the 18 to 21 year olds were infected than the youngest, younger ones, and the highest level of infection was in a village called Thaliswat. Um, the longitudinal study, the 104 people that came back to be measured didn't differ at all really by age, height, and weight between the infected and the uninfected um, cases. I'm not going to tell you very much about MDA consumption because my sampling isn't um, suitable for that kind of analysis and Ben's going to tell you a lot more about that tomorrow. But it's just interesting that we had um, quite an increase in the uptake of MDA after the study. I think it's really, these people got some education about why they were taking the MDA and it's one of the things that I identified that wasn't really what I was looking for but um, a lot of issues with uh, people not understanding what the medication's for. Interesting that the girls kind of got that message, whereas if you look at the, the males, they, they actually took it less after, after the, um, being involved in the study. With the mechanical tonometer, at every single measuring point, we saw a softening of the tissue in the infected cases. The largest differences were between the um, the calf on the non-dominant leg and the anterior thigh on the dominant leg. None of these um, made any st uh, reached statistical significance. With the indrometer, we saw the same thing. Every single measure of the point, the um, infected uh, young people had a softening of the tissue compared to the uninfected people. The largest difference is again the non-dominant calf and the anterior thigh and this time we do see a statistical, uh, statistical um, difference at the non-dominant calf. The skin fibre meter, we didn't see any difference here um, between the infected and uninfected groups, possibly because at this very latent stage we wouldn't really expect to see any um, changes in the skin. Most of the changes are occurring in the subcutaneous tissue. Again, we saw absolutely no difference between the circumference of the limbs. And again, they don't have any clinical sign of disease, so that's really what you'd expect. If we look just at that non-dominant calf measuring point um, after the MDA and after some of the positive uh, cases had taken the deworming medication, we see a, a decrease. So the calf has got um, harder. So this is, you know, a larger reading is softer. So the calf's got a little harder and then it's 
gotten softer again, but because that happened in both groups, I think this is more likely to be a seasonal change. This measure was done in the cooler, drier months, and heat and, and humidity affect fluid loads in the tissue naturally, so I think that's more likely to be a seasonal effect. We did lose statistical significance after the treatment of the positive cases at that point, so maybe there is something further to explore there in the effect of the uh, deworming medication. I've got a lot of uh, analysis still to do. We've only just begun on our analysis pathway. Um, we haven't uh, looked yet at the bioimpedance spectroscopy, which I suspect will show us some things because that's showing very small changes in fluid loads in the tissues, which again would be imperceptible by other measures. Um, and I really think that the most interesting stuff is going to come out of analysis of the biochemical markers because we know that these things are changing well before there's any clinical sign of disease and we know that both from the cancer population and the filariasis population. So even though I didn't reach a great deal of statistical significance with the analysis that I've done so far, I do think that this completely uniform trend of softening in the tissue of the infected um, kids is something that can't be ignored. So there's definitely something going on there. I'd really like to see us um, acknowledge and, and uh, establish formally a stage zero in filarial lymphedema. I notice a lot of researchers are using it, but it's not yet in the WHO guidelines. And I also think that we need to do a lot more in those early stages of lymphedema. We should be looking for these cases much more proactively and intervening so that we can use very simple, very cost-effective, low-resource interventions to prevent chronic disease from developing rather than waiting until it's all too late. And of course we're going to need further research to find out what is the best way to identify those people that are most at risk and then what is the um, most in you know, cost-effective point and form of intervention. I've got a lot of people to thank. Obviously a lot of institutions that um, I relied on in Myanmar, the Ministry of Health in particular, and the program managers for the LF program there. Uh, Vector-borne disease control in Mandalay, that gave me a huge amount of support. The laboratories in Mandalay and Yangon I couldn't have done the, uh, uh, got, got, or met, handled the plasma at all without them. WHO uh, Myanmar Regional Office gave me a huge amount of support, as did um, the Australian Embassy in Yangon. And the JCU World Health Organization Collaborating Centre uh, also was a great source of support for this study. Of course, I couldn't have done it without my local research assistants out in the field, and I'm very grateful to the participants that came to be involved, because if you think about the nature of my study, there's absolutely no benefit to them in being involved in a study stage. I didn't receive any formal funding for the, for the study, so I went to crowdfunding and uh, all of the data collection was funded by private donors. I also had a lot of support from other um, services who donated goods, services, you know, giving me free freight, Singapore Airlines gave me discounted airfares, all kinds of things and also um, the JC College of Healthcare Sciences who funded my travel to this meeting and the um, collaborating centre at JCU that provided a lot of the consumables for the lab, lab, lab work. The project has a blog, a Facebook page and a Twitter account if you'd like to find out more about it. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for, for questions. So do you have any um, data about the relationship between, between these uh, various types of measurements and um, other measures of uh, early lymphedema, be it um, li uh, lymphocentigraphy or, um, um, or even something like ultrasound in terms of, in terms of making correlation between, between these measurements that you're doing and um, some of these, kind of, let's just call them more, more anatomical measures. No, and in fact I've stayed away at this point from those very um, 
very expensive kinds of, of um, and invasive, you know, kinds of things like lymphocentigraphy. Ultimately, we probably want some, you know, when we've really honed down what we're looking at, we probably want some confirmation along those lines. But I'm really looking for what can be used in the field by a local health worker with no, you know, little or no cost to the program. The biomedically, sorry that I haven't yet managed to get all the bioimpedance data um, cleaned up enough to the point of actually analysing it yet because I think that that is um, something that's going to show us, um, you know, quite a bit of, of it, that's going to fill in some of the gaps that, that perhaps just these mechanical devices are not showing us yet at this point. And sort of one last question, in terms of um, if you were to do the, these measurements uh, twice or three times in the same area, uh, is there is there a, because the differences are relatively small, they are, they're um, very is, small. is there an error rate, uh, a, you know, a, a reasonable, a, yeah. a good correlation yeah. b among measurements? Yeah, uh, and, uh, and that's the other bit of data that I haven't uh, yet managed to analyse is the reliability study that I'm conducting on an Australian population and a Myanmar population for the devices. Um, I've worked for a long time in uh, cancer, breast cancer research and with these devices and um, they are, uh, with, a, with an experienced user, they are uh, reasonably reliable. We of course always take um, duplicate measures and average the, the measures. So um, in my reliability study I've, I've taken triplicate measures. In the, in the study that I've just uh, given you we use duplicate measures and average them. So that kind of, you know, evens out some of the variability. But yes, they are, they're quite variable. And one, you know, if, if these are the devices that we might be able to use in the future, then one of the things that we will have to do is determine some kind of cut-off value so that they can be used in the field um, and, and the user can have a, a, a chart of, you know, probably age and gender and, and whatever it works out to be that makes a difference, occupation perhaps, and and if the tissue is softer above a certain level, then that that should flag a, an at-risk person. But yeah, that we're a long way from having all of that um, analysed yet, I'm sorry. Janet, along those lines, how easy is it then to train on the interometer or skin fibrometer? <laughs> how, how is that then? They're actually really simple devices to use because uh, particularly the new um, digital version, it, tricky with the old tonometer, you had to really you know, get good skills at that, but, but the new ones, both the um, digital interometer and the skin fibrometer have built-in mechanisms. If you press too hard, the device will tell you too hard, too soft, too slow, and make you retake the measure. The skin fibrometer, actually, you have to take five measurements before it will give you a, a readout. Um, so, so those devices have that kind of thing. Uh, built into them and um, I think that by uh, Flinders Biomedical Engineering are doing even more development of the injurometer to to even build in more of those kind of fail -safes. They are They are devices that are designed for therapists not researchers so they need to have that kind of reliability and consistency built into their design. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you.